Let us turn our Bible to John chapter 6. We'll be reading from verses 48 to 52 and then from 66 to verse 69. John chapter 6 verse 48. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which people may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Verse 66 From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to live too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, as we come before you this day, we ask that you will speak to us through your word, that you will continue to encourage us, that we may learn to live a life of faith, to continue to put our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, praise God, after months of social isolation, Singapore has finally reopened our economy. In phase two, life has kind of like returned to some form of normalcy, but the challenges are still very great on both the medical as well as the economic front. Many countries are battling the spread of COVID-19 and also its re resurgence. Uh, governments everywhere are constantly trying to manage the associated economic fallout. It will be a long road to recovery. So let us pray for God's mercy. Let us pray that a vaccine will be found soon. Let us pray for livelihoods to be preserved, especially for those working in industries that have been adversely affected. And let us also remember the poor and the needy. We need to do all that we can socially and economically, but to ride out this storm and to come out stronger on the other side, it is easy, equally important that we learn to dig deeper into our spiritual resources. Thank God the Bible is filled with examples of men and women who overcame adversities to accomplish God's purposes in their lives. Just like them, we too are called to be an overcomer in Jesus. So if you're watching this uh, with someone, would you turn to the person and say, you are more than an overcomer in Christ. That's right, we are more than an overcomer in Jesus. So today we want to look at one of these characters in the Old Testament. And from his life, we want to uh, see how we can derive three points that will enable us to live in God's blessing in the midst of these challenges that we're going through. Firstly, to learn to trust in the goodness of God. Secondly, to look out for God-given opportunities. And finally, to commit to follow Jesus. Today, we want to look at a character that is little known in the Old Testament. In fact, all that we know about this man was recorded in two obscure verses buried in a long genealogy in the first nine chapters of First Chronicles. Let us turn to First Chronicles chapter 4. And let us take a look at verse 9. Jabez was honored more than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. Jabez was a descendant of Judah, and the Bible tells us that he was more honored than his brothers. And this comes as a surprise because his, the odds were stacked against him as he was growing up. His name sounds like the Hebrew word for pain. His mother had given him that name because he was birthed in much pain. We were not told the details, but the pain could be a physical one caused by a difficult childbirth, or it could be an emotional pain due to the circumstances under which Jabez was born. I think the latter is highly plausible 
because in the genealogy listing fathers and sons, Jabez's father was glaringly left out. We do not know the reason for his absence, but in ancient Israel, life without a man in the family could be extremely difficult. Even though God made provisions in his laws and statutes for the children of Israel to care for the widows and the fatherless, in practice, this group of people was often victims of oppression, whose rights were subverted and needs ignored. That was why, as you read the prophets, you will often hear them speaking out in support of justice, urging acts of kindness for this group of people. So it wouldn't be hard to imagine that Jabez led a hard life as a child. On top of that, he had to live with the stigma of being the child who called, caused his mother pain. Every time someone called his name, he was reminded of his painful past, a child who caused pain. But to our surprise, or should I say to our delight, Jabez did not grow bitter about his lot in life. He did not grow up with a deficit self-esteem. Against the odds, he grew up to be a man honored by others. In fact, there was a city where the families of the scribes lived, which was probably named after him, leading scholars to believe that Jabez was actually a famous teacher of the law. So the question is, how did Jabez shake off the shackles of his past to become the man that he was? Well, the Bible continues to tell us, Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you will bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. Growing up in the community of faith, Jabez sang and heard stories of the God who delivered his ancestors out of slavery in Egypt. How God entered into a covenant with Israel and made them his own. How God promised them a land flowing with milk and honey if they would follow him faithfully. He would guide and care for them like a shepherd. God would be their God and they would be his people. So, as one of the sons of Israel, Jabez knew that he had a right to the promised land, to cultivate and to enjoy a land flowing with abundance. That was his true destiny. And so he cried out to God to bless him and to give him his inheritance. And God granted his request. You know, 20 years ago, Bruce Wilkinson, a Bible teacher, wrote, a book on the story of Jabez. And in the book, he suggested that if you were to pray the same prayer that Jabez prayed every day, you would be able to unlock God's blessing over your life. He credited his own success to 30 years of praying daily this prayer. Now, there are some good teachings in that book, but to teach that God, that we can treat God like a genie in the bottle is definitely one, not one of them. You see, God cannot be controlled nor manipulated. We may intercede, we may plead for His grace and mercy, but ultimately, God chooses to do what He wants. The story of Jabez was recorded in the Bible not to give us a magical formula for prayer, but the story of Jabez was recorded to encourage faith and faithfulness to God in the midst of life's challenges. The admirable, the admirable thing about Jabez was that he continued to believe God is a good God in spite of the conflicting circumstances in his life. Most people would behave like Lord's wife. They would curse God and die in tough times. That's what hardship does to us, do to us. It makes us bitter and cause us to turn away from God. But men and women of faith would do otherwise. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. 
See, faith leads us into the throne room of God with the conviction that God is good and that He rewards those who trust Him and who seek Him. That's why faith grows as we discover and experience the goodness and the faithfulness of God over time. That's what Jabez did, and God honored him. Secondly, let us look out for God-given opportunities. In the midst of all the disruptions and challenges, our tendency is to turn on our survival mode. Challenges tend to make us bend inward and focus on ourselves. But that was not Jabez. Instead, Jabez prayed that God would enlarge his border, that God would open up new opportunities and possibilities in his life. We too should ask God to open up new frontier amidst this current crisis. You see, along with the challenges, COVID-19 has presented us with great opportunities. This may mean taking on a new role or new responsibilities in our workplace or leaving our current jobs for new possibilities. It may be taking the risk to strike out on our own or taking our businesses into new markets or new services. Don't clamp up into a survival mode. Instead, ask God to show you where the opportunities are and then be bold to venture into these frontiers. Let us pray that God may bless us and enlarge our border. That's what I've been praying ever since the beginning of COVID-19. And God has answered that prayer in some ways. We'll share with you about the CLAP initiative and how God has given us opportunities to help those who are affected economically by the crisis. Now, of course, this ministry is not just about providing financial assistance. Where appropriate, our pastoral staff come alongside the beneficiaries to provide pastoral care as well. Besides CLAP, you have also heard that Good News Community Services, our community service arm, have branched into a new ministry through Passeri's Family Service Centre, providing shelter to the rough sleepers. In fact, their work is coming on, coming on quite well, and we're looking at another shelter in Changi Point. But besides serving the community, COVID-19 has also presented us with other kinds of opportunities. You know, the staff spent the past one to two months reviewing our ministries and exploring possibilities that lie ahead of us. Due to the restrictions on physical interactions, many of our regular activities have now gone online. The World Wide Web has been around for ages, of course, but many businesses and organizations, including many churches like ours, did not find it necessary to explore the potential of cyberspace. We were all too caught up with our traditional brick and mortar businesses. When all of a sudden, COVID-19 hits, and the internet becomes the only viable platform to continue our business. Indeed, the internet had opened up a, a new frontier for Christian missions and ministries. Through the internet, the whole world is now within our reach. Every year, do you know that Chapel of the Resurrection spends about 12% of our budget on missions and outreaches? We send teams regularly overseas to bring the gospel to people of other cultures in the foreign lands. Now that God has opened up the world to us through the internet, we cannot simply just walk away. Already, we are hearing testimonies of how loved ones of our members uh, who were previously uncomfortable to join us for an on-site church service are now watching our online services. You know, I can imagine that if our online uh, uh, service or, or presence is interesting and engaging, others could be drawn to explore the Christian faith as well. As well, Our online ministry can then become a funnel through which non-church goers can come into our community. Technology has helped us transcend limitation of time and space. In spite of the restrictions, cell meetings and functional groups continues to meet via 
uh, virtual platforms like Zoom. Leaders now meet more regularly and readily to encourage one another and to be equipped. Church gathers more frequently to pray for one another. In fact, our attendance at self group and prayer meetings have gone up because technology had helped to mitigate some of these barriers which had hindered uh, part participation in the past. Now, I have no time to list down all these possibilities because they are just too numerous. So the question is not whether we should plant a stake in cyberspace, but rather uh, to plant a stake in cyberspace and make use of technology. The question is how can we do that effectively? I've asked Calvin and Shirley to form a team to put more thoughts into this area. So if you are passionate about technology or you have ideas about how we can engage in cyberspace, please get in touch with Calvin or Shirley. Thirdly, we want to be committed to follow Jesus no matter what. Jabez approached God because he trusted in God's goodness. Jabez prayed that God will extend his borders and lead him into new frontiers. Lastly, Jabez prayed that God's hand might be with him, that he would keep him from harm so that it might not bring him pain. God's hand represents his strength and his intervention. In other words, Jabez was praying that God would be fully involved in his life to direct his path and to keep him from harm. Jabez wasn't just going after God's blessing. He wanted to live a life that truly honours God. And that is a steep contrast with the crowd that was following Jesus. Listen to what the Lord says. Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, uh, the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. The crowd was following Jesus only because Jesus was meeting their needs. And true enough, when Jesus dialed up his demands, many stopped following him. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 35. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Like how Moses satisfied the children of Israel in the wilderness with the manna from heaven, Jesus says he is that heavenly bread that will bring true meaning and satisfaction into our lives. In other words, a truly abundant and meaningful life can only be found in Jesus. More specifically, our life can in, in, indeed truly be satisfying only when we feed on the words of Jesus, when we adopt his views and his way of life. In this way, Jesus feeds us spiritually, like how bread feeds our stomach physically. When the crowd heard that, they abandoned ship. You know, 2020 was designated by the church in Singapore to be a year of discipleship. And I believe it, it is not a coincidence that God has brought about the great shaking through COVID-19 in this year of discipleship. You see, through the crisis, the challenge that Jesus posed to the crowd is now directed at you and me in a very tangible way. When the going gets tough, Will we still follow Jesus? Are we following Jesus for the blessings that He can give? Or are we following Him because we believe that to live well means to embrace Jesus' view of life and His way of life? I've been asking myself these questions. How is COR producing disciples for Jesus? Are we helping one another pursue life and, and live out the life that Jesus came to offer? Do we know what that looks like in the first place? What does being a disciple of Jesus mean to us here in COR? 
are we more occupied with transferring biblical knowledge or are we truly helping one another to be transformed on the inside by the values of God's kingdom? How is everyone in CUR involved in a meaningful and intentional discipleship relationship? Making disciples is the core business of the church. The church is a community where we help one another lift out our commitment to follow Jesus. As a community, we learn to embrace the abundance Jesus promised us as we live out our common life in service and love to one another and to the world that's out there. When Jesus dialed up his demands, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. He turned to the twelve and he asked them, Do you also want to leave too? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe they have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Is that your conviction too? How can we prepare ourselves so that we continue to live in abundance and, and in the will of God amidst COVID-19 and the challenges that it brings. Firstly, let us trust always that God is a good God. Secondly, let us look, look out for the God-given opportunities in this crisis. And lastly, let us commit to follow Jesus no matter what. Let us pray. Lord, thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you are a God who rewards those who seek you. And you are a God who answers prayer. You are a God who remembers your covenant. You are a God who ensures that your people live out our calling in our lives. You resource us, you provide for us, you enable us. And Lord, we're going to come before you as a church today. And this weekend, especially as we uh, conduct our AGM, we want to commit our church into your hands. We pray, Lord, help COR in the journey ahead to be a church who will always trust and believe in the goodness of God. Regardless of the circumstances that we're going through, that we will remember always that God has been good to us and God will continue to be good to us. And help us, Lord, that in the midst of going through these challenges in the way that's ahead of us, Lord, that we will not clamp up and, and bend inwards, but we'll be on the lookout for God-given opportunities to do good, Lord, and to enter into new frontiers, Lord, to broaden our sphere of influence and blessing to the world. Help us, Lord, to have the faith to follow you. And lastly, we, we pray that, Lord, you will make COR into a community of faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, that no matter what, we'll be committed to follow you, Lord, and to serve you and to cling on to you. So, Lord, lead us in the way ahead. Lord, may you continue to guide us. May you continue to pour forth your blessings upon us that the world may know that indeed you are the living God and you live amongst your people. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name.